Our first Final Fantasy GPU benchmark is pretty unique for a few reasons. One of them is that it has 1440p benchmarks. The utility does not officially include the 1440p resolution, but you can make it work through command line. We use scripted automation for all this testing, so it should be pretty damn consistent and accurate run to run. It's all done by automation, so no real room for error there. We studied the game completely for the benchmark portion to understand what we were testing and have a separate video on that. We have a graphics analysis in this video that talks about specific graphics techniques that the technical artists used to help all of us understand why this game is as taxing of GPU hardware as it is. And then uh, final two unique points. We have a Titan V in here just because why not? It's been a month since we saw it. And uh, also I'm gonna occasionally refer to it as Final Fantasy XV, just to annoy you all. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly, makers of the Conductonaut liquid metal that we recently used to drop 20 degrees off of our temperatures. Thermal Grizzly also makes traditional thermal compounds for use on top of the IHS, like Cryonaut and Hydronaut pastes. Learn more at the link below. So let's start this out by talking about what they're doing with the benchmark. The benchmark is only 3.7 gigabytes. It doesn't contain the whole game. It's not fully representative of the entire game. However, it's six minutes long and it takes huge portions of the game in the uh, open world environment. So we actually get a really good look condensed at the entire game as a whole, despite it not being necessarily fully representative of everything in the game. This means we can analyze the graphics quality because it's actually really damn demanding and the visuals of the game are pretty impressive. So you look at things like the uh, metallic paint where you can see paint specs in one of the car uh, paint jobs. It's actually pretty cool stuff and we'll talk about more of that in a minute. Before getting to that, there's some information as well on the benchmark, specifically how Square, Square Enix is uploading the data from, I don't know if it's aggregate data from users or how they're collecting it, but basically there is some form of aggregate pooled data on their website. And depending on how you test your device, there could potentially be some poisoning of data there because it's not necessarily fully controlled. Those tests could be run on various configurations with various CPUs, for example, which would skew the results. So we are running the test in a controlled fashion, and we also have 1440p benchmarks in here uh, just to, to give a bit of an extra. But uh, let's move into some of the first major items that we noticed with performance. A quick note, confirmation was received from Square Enix on the settings. We talked about this in a previous content piece where we were uncertain if the graphic settings were the same between high, medium, and low across all resolutions. Square Enix did confirm for us that the graphics quality settings remain the same across all resolutions. So the very first thing to point out is that you're gonna see interesting, significant differences between AMD and Nvidia in the GPU charts, and this is particularly at high and medium settings. You'll also see differences between same brand devices across these two settings. So uh, this is partly because of the frame time variance. We can pull up a chart now that shows the frame times of an NVIDIA card at high and medium using the settings shown in the chart. We're using an NVIDIA card here because this is a GameWorks game and NVIDIA's had the most access to it, presumably. So to show that they have frame time variance reveals that the game doesn't run perfectly even on NVIDIA hardware who have optimized for it the most because it is using GameWorks options. So frame time variance here is far greater with high settings and frame to frame intervals become looser and more stuttered. This causes visible hitching, so to speak, during gameplay and exists even on 1080 Ti's. It's particularly bad during the first run of a benchmark but is ever present with high settings. Moving to medium largely removes the issue as shown in the frame time plot. Despite being an NVIDIA supported title, both NVIDIA and AMD suffer in the frame time department, specifically with high settings. So as we go through the benchmark charts, keep a close eye on Vega 56 and Vega 64 positioning relative to each other at high and medium. Let's get into some of the graphics analysis of what the six minutes of the benchmark shows us and why those six minutes are so taxing. One of the most immediate and important items to point out is the tessellation in the game. So between AMD and Nvidia, they both handle geometry differently. AMD has expanded its geometry pipe in recent years, but Nvidia maintains an advantage in dealing with heavy tessellation, something that's been true since the crisis days. At 15 seconds into the benchmark, we noticed that Square Enix used a heavy amount of tessellation in the ground and terrain, rather than using a traditional normal map for the ground. 
This adds perceived depth to the surface by allowing displacement to increase apparent detail via tessellation, and tessellation is basically a doubling of the triangles on the graphics hardware, so 4 becomes 8, and so on. This makes the surface seem higher resolution, and it's also why we get the added bumps, a few of which we can highlight in the video production. The card doesn't conform to the surface from what we can tell, but it's more geometrically complex of a surface, and it makes it more interesting to look at. The actual value, however, is debatable. Geometric complexity like this costs a lot, and if your device, AMD or NVIDIA, is struggling with heavy tessellation, we'd assume you'd be able to separately disable this in the final game. There are also options in the driver settings where you can tune this down. Interestingly, at 3 minutes 58 in the video, it appears that the ground is no longer tessellated. We think that Square Enix has switched to a traditional normal map here. We're not sure if this is because it's a known combat scene with a lot of other complex elements to render, or if it's for some other reason. Let's rewind to some other impactful settings. At 27 seconds into the benchmark, we noticed some high-quality reflection techniques being used by Square Enix on the car. The door and the mirrors of the truck are dynamically reflecting the environment. We don't think these are using screen space reflections because you can see clouds and other background elements dynamically reflected in those surfaces. At 50 seconds, we noticed that the trees are using flat alpha textures instead of particles or some sort of Gameworks plugin. This is a bit of a primitive way to do things, but is cheap in terms of resource cost. Five seconds later, we pass a truck with extremely detailed textures as seen on the front of the vehicle, and this is a major contributor to VRAM consumption that penalizes 4GB GPUs, as you'll see in the charts in a bit. There are high-quality textures in this game. There's also some motion blur going on, and we further notice that the truck leaves behind some ghosted lines that slowly fade, something we saw again at 3 minutes 4 seconds, where the fishing pole leaves similar ghosted lines. At 56 seconds, just after the truck, you can see some highly noticeable limited shadow draw distance pop in in the background where the environment elements and the shadows are getting drawn as we approach them. At 1 minute 54, the chocobos are using traditional alpha textures for fur as opposed to hairworks or other gameworks effects, which we know are bundled in because they're used on character model hair for the main characters. The tail feathers do use some sort of advanced physics calculations when the chocobo runs or moves, but nothing special for the fur as far as we can see. At 2 minutes, you can see soft shadows cast by trees, and it's noticeable by the way the shadows soften as the leaves get further from the ground, as opposed to the base of the tree that's closer to the ground and uses a harder shadow. This might be part of NVIDIA's Frustum Trace shadows, but it could also just be an older soft shadow technique. At 2 minutes 33 seconds, there's a great example of screen space reflections. If you don't know what that is, you will now. We can demonstrate this by looking at the tree leaf that occludes the background mountains. The game is using screen space to calculate reflections of the mountains onto the lake, but the occlusion results in missing information in screen space, so the reflection is inaccurate and incomplete, and you get that weird reflection effect on the lake. The alternative to this would be planar reflections, but the hardware cost is too great to use in most real-time scenarios. 3 minutes 53 seconds is also an interesting scene. As Noctis warps across the screen, we can see the background bridge refracting in Noctis's mesh, similar to what you'd see with a straw in a glass of water, for instance. This is another advanced rendering technique that has some physical hardware cost to it. We'll cut that there, but keep an eye out for our full graphics analysis coming soon. Subscribe for that, we're trying to do more of them. For now though, we've established some of why the game is as graphically intensive as it is, and why it's so taxing on the hardware. Let's get into the charts. As always, you can check the article link in the description below for more information on this and for the bench platform. Our 1080p high chart will start us off, as that's likely what most of you are interested in. The Titan V has some immediate difficulty with the lows here, more than the other devices, but it's also not really something we're expecting anyone else to use to play games. We just threw it in because we had it. Moving on to actual gaming cards, everything from the Vega cards and up do reasonably well in averages, but the frame time hit at high settings introduces occasional stutters or long intervals between frames. We showed those frame time plots earlier, this is the real impact of that. This impacts AMD and Nvidia alike, though AMD does take a bigger hit, as illustrated on Vega versus the 0.1% lows of the neighboring 1070 and 1060 cards. That said, we're talking 9 FPS versus 15 FPS for 0.1% lows, so it's 
not really a major victory for NVIDIA. Nothing to brag about at this point. What we really need is the ability to custom tune settings so that we can find out which one is tanking the frame time performance and causing those long frame to frame intervals. Until the game launches though, we won't have that. Let's move on to 1080p medium next. This settings configuration would be ideal for something like a GTX 1066 gigabyte card with the RX 500 series high end not doing too poorly here either. You could use either and probably be happy with it, especially once you can actually tune the settings manually. Vega 56 does reasonably well despite its frame time consistency and manages a 77 FPS average. The card is still outperformed by the 1070 by about 9.7%, but we'll see if AMD's future updates do anything to help with this. Before getting to 1440p, we also ran a few low end devices at 1080p low settings. The results are on the screen now. The 1060 predictably leads, managing 80 FPS at low, and this device can handle medium settings fine, so no surprise here. The RX 574 gigabyte card is struggling in the frame time department once again, but manages a FPS average, respectively. The 1050 Ti places similarly to the RX 570, both at about 49 FPS average. And the RX 560 16 CU card, the original one that was shipped, not the later ones with 14 CUs, is about 10 FPS behind the 1050 Ti OC. It's not actually overclocked, MSI just calls it that. It's one of the cheapest 1050 Ti's. 1440p benchmarks are something we're proud to somewhat uniquely offer because we scripted our tests and automated them so we're able to force the game to run at resolutions not included in the built-in benchmark, and that includes 1440p. At 1440p high settings, obviously without the ability to customize the options, the GTX 1080 Ti exceeds 60 FPS average and manages to hit 72 FPS throughout. The lows at about 49 and 22 FPS look better than previously, but 22 is still dismal when compared to 72 as your average. This is a problem with the high settings primarily. The 0.1% low values here are still suffering, and this is repeatable on all devices when tested with high settings for the graphics. Although the average frame rate may still be 72 FPS, you'll see visible stutters and hitches on occasion, particularly when loading a new area for the first time that boot or in the first time in a while. We'll need to wait for the final game to see if this gets ironed out. The 1080 Ti leads the 1080 by 28%, with a GTX 1080 operating at 56 FPS average with similarly painful frame times. The GTX 1080 leads the next card, the 1070 Ti, by 11.8%, and there's enough of a gap here that overclocking could more or less close it, even when also overclocking the 1080. The GTX 1070 manages a 46 FPS average, with the Vega 64 Strix card operating a 39 FPS average. Pay close attention here to Vega 56, 64, and the GTX 1070. Right now, the 1070 is leading even Vega 64, which probably shouldn't be the case. But as we move on to 1440p medium, you'll see what's going on. So here's where it gets interesting then. At 1440p high, to recap, the 1070 leads Vega 64 by a sizable 16.5%, and it leads its direct Vega 56 competitor by 30%. That's absolutely massive considering the cards are much closer together in other benchmark titles and that Vega 56 often even outpaces the 1070 in like for like testing. At 1440p medium, things change. The GTX 1070 now runs at 60 FPS average with the Vega 64 card surpassing it at 63 FPS average. Vega 56 still trails at 55, but previously, we were about 30% ahead with the 1070 over Vega 56, and with medium settings from high, the 1070 is now just 7.3% ahead of Vega 56. That's a big reduction. As predicted in our pre-test video, the gap was closed almost entirely by dropping a couple of settings, potentially GameWorks options for which AMD hasn't yet optimized because medium disables all GameWorks options. That would explain a lot here. It could also just be general tessellation and LOD or view distance settings, which would feed a lot of geometry and primitives to a card that has historically, compared to its competition, struggled a little bit more with both. Still, the 1070 Ti leads both Vega devices, and both Vega devices still struggle on the frame time front. Here's a plot of the 1070 Ti's frame times for the medium runs mapped up against Vega 64's frame times. Additional spikiness in the AMD card presents itself in this testing. We'll have to wait and see if AMD's Final Fantasy XV drivers released later, closer to the game's launch, will fix any of this. AMD has told us they're not planning to release drivers for this benchmark today, but they'll address it once there's a real game to address. 
At 4K high settings, the GTX 1080 Ti operates an average FPS of 46 with lows at 27 and 12. 12, pretty, pretty bad. Again, this frame time deviation is derived specifically from the high settings. Until a point at which we can manually toggle those settings, we can't say for sure what specific options are causing that behavior. None of these devices are particularly well equipped for Final Fantasy 15 at 4K high in its present state, but full graphics customization options should help. The Titan V, for what it's worth, operates the highest average by about 21%, but it also has worse frame time consistency, a lot worse, and it's to a point of being actually noticeable in gameplay. I'd rather have one of the lower end devices with higher 0.1% lows to play this game than the Titan V. For 4K medium settings, the GTX 1080 Ti struggled to maintain its 52 FPS average with 1% lows dipping down to 41 FPS. Frame times aren't as much of a concern here as they are with high settings as illustrated by the close proximity between the 1% and 0.1% lows in all tested devices except for the R9 Fury X, which has two times worse 99.9 .9 percentile frame time values. The GTX 1080 predictably lands second, but it's a shallow victory, 40 FPS average, marking the 1080 Ti about 34% ahead of the 1080. The RX Vega 64 Strix card puts in a good run with its 36 FPS average, comparatively, led by the 1080 by about 8%. Dollar for dollar, assuming GPU prices were a thing anyone abided by, that would be a direct comparison. Low-end frame time performance is a bit worse on the Vega 64 card, but this game isn't particularly 4K friendly anyway. The Fury X isn't too far back from Vega 64 in average FPS, but drops the ball with 0.1% low values. This is probably, at least in part, due to the frame buffer size, because you can look at the game, see the texture sizes, and generally assume that it's using a lot of memory. So for the conclusion, there's a lot more that could be said here. We'll try and outline some of it in the article below. That said, this testing's been going on for uh, 13 hours at this point, I think. So, uh, actually more than that. So, it's been a long day of testing. We have lots of content on the website and on the channel already. If I've left something out, sorry, we'll get to it eventually. But uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's 4.30 a.m. Cut me, cut me some slack. So, we've been testing since the benchmark came out. We have several articles on the site. Uh, we also have CPUs to go still, and we've started that testing, just need to finalize it. If you feel like there's uh, something really specific that you'd like us to look at for CPUs, you still have some time to get that request in because we are still working on getting the benchmarks going. Got the methodology figured out, just need to get the tests running. So that's it for now. Subscribe for more. Make sure you catch our graphics analysis and CPU coverage. And as always, go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Tell us that directly where I've been hanging out in the Discord talking with everyone as we are running these benchmarks live. And finally, go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one or one of our other products. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.